Right, we were just bringing you those dramatic pictures of the dragon capsule uh, coming back to Earth uh, and splashing down into the Atlantic Ocean uh, with four parachutes. And we're going to talk it through now uh, with Libby Jackson, who's Human Exploration Program Manager at the UK Space Agency. Thank you so much for being with us. Let's show those pictures again because they were rather marvellous, oh, weren't they? Yeah. And it all went without a hitch, didn't it? It seems to have done. Uh, it's been a beautiful shot. Oh, wonderful to see something splashing down. It's not happened uh, for over 50 years, they were saying, or about that in um, the US. Since that was the, that was the Apollo, that the was famous the, shots exactly. of Apollo, yes. Indeed, and since then we've had the Space Shuttle. Since that's been retired in 2011, the only way to and from the International Space Station has been on the Soyuz capsule that Russia fly, which is a very reliable system, but sometimes it does break. We saw it last year. Mm. And this is the, the first steps towards us having many different ways to getting to the International Space Station, which is hugely important to keep this scientific laboratory uh, running uh, with crew on board. Just talk us through then, for, for people who aren't experts on sort of space politics and the space industry, why is this mission, this SpaceX Dragon mission, so important? It is the, the first of these commercial uh, crew missions. It's NASA now paying companies not um, to build a ticket, but they are paying for seats. And that's a change in how it's been done um, in human spaceflight. Private companies like that, this sort of model will be really important as we look to return humans to the moon, to go on to Mars for all the scientific purposes that we're doing. The UK expects to be a part of that. Um, and these missions, will, these companies will play their part in that. So it's all part of an ecosystem coming together. So space, in a way, is being privatised. Yeah, indeed. I've, I've heard it said uh, on Twitter somewhere. We all now fly in aeroplanes every day. We don't have to buy our whole aeroplane to travel from A to B. Um, this is helping... Uh, with space for that point of view. Space underpins our everyday lives, the satellites everywhere. Companies like SpaceX are bringing the cost of launches down. That will enable us to get more technology into space, which can help everybody back yeah. on Earth. And some very rich people like Elon Musk who want to be involved or want a slice of the action. There are uh, lots, of, lots of companies out there. Um, we're seeing some of them here in the UK. We've put legislation in place uh, to allow a spaceport, a number of spaceports to, to open. It, it is a very exciting time mm. in exploration in space in general. Today, we've seen uh, a mission called SMILE, which will be funded. I will look at solar wind here, um, or will there be instruments in the UK. Solar wind can knock out satellites, as I said, that are part of our everyday lives. It can knock out um, things, power grids down here on Earth as well. So after the success of this, uh, of the Dragon, what, what, what happens next? Because this was not manned, not, mm -hmm. there was nobody on board, there was a, a dummy, wasn't mm -hmm. there? Yes, it was not crewed. Uh, uh, right, Riddler, there was a mannequin on board that had um, sensors. If all goes well, we'll see the first flights. They're saying July might be a little while longer. The engineers will be looking to make sure that everything is good. We'll also see another demonstration flight from Boeing, the other uh, spacecraft that will be going to the International Space Station. And all being well, by the end of the year, we will see uh, more ways to get crew to the International Space Station. Exciting stuff. Uh, Libby Jackson, thank you so much from the UK Space Agency. Thank Many you. thanks. Something we're also watching for you here on Impact. This is the hour when we're expecting and hoping for a successful conclusion to the latest American space experiment. As the Dragon capsule built by the commercial company SpaceX comes back to Earth after undocking from the International Space Station earlier today. Here's the moment it undocked. From the International Space Station, 1.32 a.m. <laughs> Relief for the first stage, but much more to come. A reminder, this capsule is carrying a mannequin, a dummy called Ripley, not a man or woman. Uh, but the hope of SpaceX and NASA is that it could carry American astronauts on its next trip, perhaps even within months. So we're going to keep watching uh, what happens uh, as the capsule re-enters the, the atmosphere. Uh, will it survive that journey down to the the waters off Florida, uh, where, which are being watched very closely, obviously, by NASA, by SpaceX, also probably by Boeing, which is, has its own uh, capsule under construction, which is also due for an experimental uh, launch uh, in the pretty near future. So we're just watching what happens here, and I'm hoping to be able to speak to our guest, uh, Bonnie Hoovel, a former NASA Space Shuttle and Space Lab engineer. Bonnie, we spoke a few days ago, and you said to me then, it's not the going up, it's the coming down. Yes, it is. This is the hardest part. What are you watching for in particular? How the heat shield performs. We know that this capsule has some irregularities in the surface that it sends to the atmosphere. Those will cause hot spots. 
and we don't know whether the heat shield will hold up and we don't know whether the heat shield will be able to keep the temperature inside the capsule livable for human beings. So Bonnie, I suppose it's possible that the capsule comes through and is recovered and we still don't know everything we need to know until they've been in and looked at it. Not quite. That's part of why Ripley carries so many sensors to tell us what it would have been like for a human being on that ride down. Because just remind us of the bigger picture here, I think SpaceX is quite ambitious on the, a time scale for sending live astronauts into space. Yes, they are. They want to send two astronauts up in July. That's very soon. Do you think that's feasible? It does sound feasible to me. This mission has gone just like clockwork so far. So if we get through re-entry and landing okay, and if Ripley says that human beings would have been fine, then we should be go for July, as long as NASA agrees. Obviously the key thing is, how did Ripley come through this, you know, how might human astronauts come through it? But is it also the case that this is a capsule that's supposed to be reusable? Yes, it is. So we need to see, does the heat shield come through intact? You might remember that the space shuttle initially had a heat shield with tiles on it and some of the tiles would come off after each flight we would have to replace those. In this case we don't have a quite such a delicate heat shield system but we still need to know does it come through intact or does it have to be replaced before each flight. And just a final thought, obviously SpaceX engineers are going to be watching this very closely, so will the engineers at Boeing. Yes they will, Boeing is a little bit behind the curve on this both companies expected to be able to start flying astronauts in 2017 so they're both a little bit behind schedule Boeing has not done their demonstration flight yet they're hoping to do it as soon as next month but it's not definite that they're doing the Starliners demo flight next month they have some catching up to do SpaceX is in the lead SpaceX is in the lead and hoping obviously for a successful recovery here Bonnie thanks very much for your time Thank you very much. Well, let's also return now to a story that's developing as I speak. We have pictures coming into us from NASA Control. We are expecting, uh, obviously, and well, we're hoping for the successful return of the SpaceX capsule. Rebecca Morell, our science correspondent, what are we looking at? The cheers are coming through. Well, at the moment, you can see that plasma cloud streaking through the sky. This is the first of two parachute deployments. Okay, so those parachutes do the initial slowing and then they're ultimately going to pull out the four main parachutes responsible for really slowing, slowing the spacecraft down, down. To, to get down there for, for a safe re-entry into the ocean but um, everything so far um, seems to have gone to, to plan. The re-entry was the toughest point. It endures temperatures of 1,500 degrees Celsius as it goes through the atmosphere. It was travelling at 30,000 kilometres an hour, but you can see it there. We have this extraordinary moment, don't we? Because we do know now, Rebecca, that it's come through in one piece. Yes. It seems we can see... Oh. There we go, and here's another parachute for deployment. As Rebecca was saying, it has to slow down now before it touches the water, but you can hear the cheers coming yeah, through. Yeah, they'll be very happy about this. So four parachutes, I think we can see now, which is going to be taking it down. It's going to be about another three minutes to get it down to the ocean. There's a recovery ship waiting there, ready to collect the capsule, because of course, no one is on board this at the moment, just a test dummy, but it's covered in sensors, and they want to analyze that data to see how, if an astronaut were inside how they would have fared during this journey but the capsule from this distant view looks pretty good the parachutes are opening up fully Should we now. just see if we can hear what they're saying on NASA are we able to, to listen descend. to the feed it's going to continue to slow down and then ultimately splash down in the Atlantic there we're now under a kilometer in altitude It's 
extraordinary moment. You can hear the hubbub. Don't you feel that everybody in NASA must be crowded into one room right now, Rebecca? Yeah, what's really interesting about this is it's a splashdown it's over the ocean. Of course, the Soyuz space crash, uh, spacecraft um, it comes down on land, so it's an entirely, which is what's been used until now to get the astronauts up to the International Space Station. So I think it was one of the Apollo missions which last um, splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean back in It does in feel 69. like watching a film. It's hard to believe in a way that this is reality here and now in yeah. 2019 with the it looks right doesn't it four parachutes deployed yeah to get the capsule down and as you say the dummy is covered in sensors yeah that's right so um, th this is a demonstration mission and you know the idea is to get astronauts up using the capsule to the International Space Station but you want to do a test mission first of all so the, the dummy um, nicknamed Ripley after the alien character um, is going to be really key so once this is actually down in the ocean it will be recovered all the data on board will be carefully analyzed to actually see that you know the atmosphere inside it looks okay from the outside from here but yes but it's, it's what's look. inside that matters just going to listen a bit more to what they're saying at nasa so i'll we'll listen we were planning on splashing down at about 5 45 a.m pacific and we're getting real close to that bingo time just past 200 meters is that 200 meters to touchdown as it were so this is what we're watching as we come to the end of our program in the last minute or so of our program we are we're going we to stay with this I'm being told we'll watch this meters, uh, that hurtling uh, momentum has been slowed down everything according to plan so far up, we're listening in standing by for splashdown Thank you to Rebecca. You've been watching the splashdown of the Dragon Space Capsule. I'll be back in 15 minutes with more on Impact. Thanks for being with us today. Hello, this is Impact, bringing you all the day's top stories and later in the programme, more news in depth. I'm Philippa Thomas. The Dragon returns. America's first commercial astronaut capsule splashes back down to Earth after a successful test mission to the International Space Station. Welcome to the programme. We're live for the next 30 minutes and you can give me your views at Philippa BBC. A piece of history has been made. The latest American space experiment, the Dragon capsule, has landed back on Earth. This is the moment the spacecraft, built by commercial company SpaceX, splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean, where a recovering vessel, recovery vessel was waiting. Uh, retro rockets slowed the Dragon down to take it through the Earth's atmosphere. After undocking from the International Space Station earlier today, parachutes slowed it to bring it calmly, as you see, down into the ocean. Just a reminder, it's not carrying astronauts, it's carrying a mannequin. The hope is, though, that it can move on to live cargo, human astronauts, maybe even within the next few months. Uh, I'm joined by our global science correspondent, Rebecca Morell. Rebecca, we were both there feeling rather breathless as we saw this touchdown. You could hear the cheers. It feels like a success. Yeah, I mean, it looked 
really, really good. And weren't those shots absolutely beautiful as well? I mean, think of the journey this thing's been on. Last Saturday, you know, up on top of a rocket, then docked to the International Space Station for six days, and then this intense re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere. You know, it endures temperatures of 1,500 degrees Celsius. It would have been travelling at 30,000 kilometres an hour. Then by the time we've seen it with those pictures, you know, it's just gently drifting down, lovely parachutes deployed with a splashdown at last. And it has been picked up by the recovery vehicle where it's going to be tested to see how, how it fared. So from what we can see, all good. Came down in one piece, parachutes, one, two, three, four, beautiful soft landing. And what are they checking now, Rebecca? Well, it's the mannequin, the test dummy that's inside, um, called Ripley, after the alien character. It was packed with sensors, and they're going to be looking really carefully at that data because, of, of course, the plan is to get astronauts in there. And you want to know that the conditions inside the capsule during launch, and particularly during re-entry, would be safe enough to get people into that into that carrier so they will be analyzing the the data but the next step is to actually try and perform an emergency abort um, while the rocket is is heading up about one minute into its mission that's in a few weeks time and that's important to see if something goes wrong that the capsule could safely jettison itself away from the, the rocket and after that perhaps um, two astronauts going up at some point over the summer July maybe August that seems really early yeah, it's quite soon, but they have been working on this for a, a long time. And SpaceX aren't the only commercial company who are going to be doing this. Boeing, too, has a contract with NASA. Both companies have been given seed funds to actually build the technology. Boeing have a carrier called the Starliner, which is going to do a similar demonstration test, um, followed by a similar astronaut test later this year as well. So it really is a big change for, for the American Space Agency to have its own carrier once again to get people up to space and back. Because it's been relying on the Russians to take yeah. astronauts up from, from all over the world in the Soyuz. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. I mean, this great sort of spacefaring nation, since the space shuttle um, program was retired back in 2011 because of safety issues, because of the two disasters, and also cost, it's had to pay the Russians to get into space. And um, so this, you know, if, if astronauts are carried up over this summer, this will be the first time that America has its own vehicle to get um, astronauts to and from. But interesting that it's commercial, because until now, NASA's yeah. actually designed and built its own vehicles to go up into space. This is different. They're going to be paying SpaceX and Boeing for seats on the carriers. Yeah, it's a really big fundamental shift in the way that the Americans carry out space exploration. And you're right to point to the fact that it's not just SpaceX, because I suppose they don't want to rely on one delivery system ever again. No, I mean, the space industry is changing massively, you know, particularly with these you know, tech billionaires who are, who are putting their money into building these Yeah, this these is Elon Musk's, of course. Yeah, yeah, Elon Musk, he owns SpaceX. You know, you've got Jeff Bezos, who's not involved in the human space flight program for the International Space Station, but space tourism. So lots of people are sort of putting their money into, into space. And it is a big fundamental shift for NASA. But of course, they've been closely involved with SpaceX because it's going to be NASA astronauts on board. But there might be a few seats free as well. So, you know, maybe European Space Agency astronauts might buy a seat on there. Who knows? Maybe Russian astronauts might buy a seat on there. Or maybe private individuals um, might buy a seat on there to go up to the space station. So but that's all to come. And it does feel as if a lot more is open now after what looks like a successful landing. Rebecca, thank you very much for sharing with us. Uh, other moving story, it's been moving for a long time, of course. But now, America's new commercial astronaut capsule has safely landed in the Atlantic Ocean, completing its test mission. The SpaceX Dragon has spent the past week in space docked with the International Space Station. This mission was uncrewed, but the plan is to use the carrier to send the first astronauts into space later this year. Let's speak to Dr. David Whitehouse, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, who joins me now. You can almost sense the, the relief and, uh, in the cheers as it, as it hit splashdown, because there, there were some concerns about this, weren't there? Yes, the splashdown was the highlight of the mission. Although we understand very well what a spacecraft goes through when it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, this is the time when the capsule is under the most stress. The heat shield is heated to 1600 degrees centigrade and the parachutes have to work. Uh, so you never really know until you see those parachutes deployed and the capsule coming down as they, as they cheered as they saw that. So this is a, a finale to a very successful mission indeed. David, there are those of us of a certain age uh, for whom this was, we all remember the Apollo missions, the capsule coming down in the sea. That was followed by the 
space shuttle, and yet this technology that we are watching today is far advanced, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, coming down in the sea makes a great deal of sense. The space shuttle, one of the reasons why it was so expensive and one of the reasons why it was eventually discontinued was because it flew into space in one piece and it came down on a runway. Very convenient, but very expensive. This is, this, as you said, the same technology as was used during the Apollo missions 50 years ago. But capsules these days are much better designed. We've got computer design, we've got better materials, we've got better computer control. So this was the sensible way to do it for a capsule of this size. Now, of course, they'll want to get the capsule on board and get all the equipment from it that monitored the, the every entry and work out what the environment would be for astronauts. But it all seems to have gone very, very smoothly, and we can expect to see uh, two people, two ex-shuttle astronauts in it later this year. Well, I mean, that, that's incredible in itself, given where SpaceX has come from. Where do you see it in, I don't know, two, five years' time? What, what has this opened the door to in terms of, of the future of space exploration? Well, at last, somebody's doing something. And you could say that SpaceX, over the last 15 years, has made NASA look slow and cumbersome. Because the story since the, since the start of the shuttle has been that NASA had had great plans to go beyond low Earth orbit, but has always stopped and started with these plans. At last, with SpaceX now providing a service to go to the space station, followed up by a backup service provided by Boeing with their Starliner, which is a similar type of craft which will fly in a month or two's time. This will enable regular access to low Earth orbit. And NASA seems to be finally getting its access together about returning to the moon. So although Elon Musk is always up to, over optimistic about going to Mars and going into deep space, realistically, I think this really opens the door for actually leaving low Earth orbit and going back to the moon for the first time in 50 years. And of course, without the need for Russian help, and that's a huge issue back here on Earth, isn't it? That is a very huge issue. Since the shuttles were retired in 2011, NASA, the Americans have had to rely on the Russians for a trip to and from the space station. And that's fraught with political and technical difficulties. There have been worries recently about the quality control of this what was a very robust and very safe spacecraft. And of course, the political problems with it being able to turn off the tap at any time to the Americans. So having Elon Musk, SpaceX and Boeing Starliner both able to deliver their own astronauts to the space station cuts Russia out of the game. And there are a lot of people in America who are glad they don't have to rely on them. David, I, I don't know if you can see the pictures we're showing now, live pictures from the ocean, and there's the capsule bobbing around there, about to, to lift it uh, on, onto the recovery ship. But uh, as I say, for, for those of us a certain age, this is very reminiscent of those amazing Apollo missions. Yes, and when the, the um, Dragon capsule is crewed, um, of course, there will be astronauts involved coming out of these capsules. So, yes, it does make sense, given the design of this spacecraft, to land it on the ocean. The Soyuz capsule lands on, on the ground in, in Siberia, and it has to fire some very powerful retro rockets just before it lands to cushion the blow. And those rockets could go wrong. They add an extra degree of complexity. Whereas SpaceX design, which is very impressive, very up-to-date, very state-of-the-art, said, we don't need those rockets. If we come down on the ocean close to uh, the Atlantic seaboard, we can pick it up uh, and we can refurbish it and refly it again. And this really is, as you say, it's similar in some ways to the Apollo capsules, but this is a high-tech capsule. This is a capsule for the future. Uh, we've talked about the Russians, and of course there are other countries involved in, in space exploration. One thinks of India and China, of course. Who at the moment, David? Who's, who's in the lead? I, well, of course, it's the Americans. The Americans have the plans. They have uh, the, the momentum behind them to go back to the moon. They have the control of the International Space Station. Sure, Russia goes through periods of resurgence and then cutbacks, as it is at the moment. India has a very interesting space program. And China is working its space program up quite slowly but methodically. 
And although it's going to be perhaps a few decades before China reaches the capabilities of the United States, although they plan to launch a small space station fairly soon, nothing like the International Space Station, China clearly has a long-term game plan. So if you had to put your look into the crystal ball, etc., for, for space in this century, I would say that in 20, 30 years' time, we'll be back on the moon, we'll be thinking about missions to Mars, and the two space superpowers will be the United States and China. David, it's very good to talk to you. There'll be some people watching thinking, I know that face, and of course you were at the BBC <laughs> for years, weren't you? I was, I was at the BBC for many years, yes. Well, it's good to have you back on. Thank you. <laughs> David Whitehouse, thanks very much. Now, America's new commercial astronaut capsule has safely landed in the Atlantic Ocean, completing its test mission. The SpaceX Dragon has spent the past week in space docked with the International Space Station and was detached this morning before returning through Earth's atmosphere. This mission was uncrewed, but the plan is to use the carrier to send the first astronauts into space later this year. Our science correspondent Palab Ghosh has the latest. It could not have gone any better. A successful splashdown for the Dragon spacecraft and a mission where everything went like clockwork. The day began with the crew of the International Space Station saying goodbye to the capsule that they may be using on their next mission. They exit, leaving behind the only occupant on the test mission, a space-suited dummy called Ripley. Then they close the hatch and send Dragon on its way home. And we have motion. You see Dragon physically separating from the International Space Station, 132. Error breaking, basically slamming into that Earth's atmosphere. Nearly six hours later, and we see it enter the Earth's atmosphere. Reach its terminal velocity, basically. Thrusters slow down its descent. Kick in. Then, splash down. It's been eight long years since the country that won the space race has been grounded. The shuttle was withdrawn from service because it was unsafe. But in 2014, NASA awarded SpaceX and Boeing a combined five billion pound contract so that each could build their own spacecraft. All of this is, is looking ahead to getting us into the inter, up into the International Space Station to prolong operations there. And then we're looking to go uh, onto the moon and onto Mars, which the wow. UK will be a part of. NASA hopes to use the vehicles to send astronauts into space later this year. Palab Ghosh, BBC News. Let's get more on our, one of our headline stories. America's new commercial astronaut capsule has safely landed in the Atlantic Ocean, completing its test mission. The SpaceX Dragon has spent the past week in space, docked with the International Space Station, was detached this morning before returning through Earth's atmosphere before landing in the Atlantic. This mission uncrewed, but the plan is to use the carrier to send the first astronauts into space later this year. Well, Dr. Jacko van Loon is an astrophysicist at Keele University, joins us now. And that was quite a moment as it came down. Uh, yes, uh, it's actually not that difficult to shoot something into space, but it's uh, much more of a challenge to bring it back home safely. Uh, as it goes through the atmosphere uh, at an extremely high speed, it heats up and could easily burn to pieces. Uh, and it has to break to... Uh, a very low speed before the parachutes can actually unfold and, and uh, bring it down that last bit and land on the water safely and softly. You could sense the relief in mission... That happened and it worked. Yes, sorry, yes, absolutely. Exactly. And you and could NASA sense... too, of course. You could, <laughs> you could sense the relief in mission control and the cheering as it came down because this means that they can now think of the next stage. And what is that? Yeah, so this, this was a, a test um, that could have carried uh, human beings uh, for all effects, uh, but obviously didn't, didn't want to risk that. But they're ready for the next flight because uh, it, it looked like the, the, the test was extremely successful. Uh, very few things to sort out. And so the next flight uh, planned for July might carry two to actual people. Um, now what they have done is actually quite similar to what, what uh, was done um, in the past by the Americans, uh, using these capsules uh, landing back uh, on, onto the water uh, in, instead of a space shuttle or something much more complicated. So in that sense, uh, perhaps it's, it's not that um, groundbreaking, but the fact that it's been done by a private company is, because this opens, of course, a whole new world of um, commercial space flights and uh, 
um, possibly competition and this is of course what NASA is after to bring down the costs of, uh, of space flights. Uh, there's a political angle to this as well because it does not want to rely on Russia forever. Uh, yes, exactly that as well. They have uh, had to uh, use Russian, um, actually very um, uh, reliable um, rockets to, to send uh, their astronauts uh, to the space uh, station. <clears throat> but uh, politically, indeed, uh, they, they'd rather that uh, it stays within the borders of the, the United States. Now, obviously, they'll be examining the capsule, uh, taking the data from it. But if everything is as they hope, when do you think they'll be sending people into space? Uh, yeah, so there's a prop inside uh, called Ripley. Uh, people may remember Sigourney Weaver playing the leading role in Aliens. Um, so uh, there, there, there's actually a prop that collects data, so they will be able to test whether, if it were human, uh, you know, the human would have been, been okay. <clears throat> and uh, if, if that's, that's confirmed, then they're ready to, to send it uh, uh, with two astronauts to the space station um, as early as in, in July this year. Uh, and that that's, is, is really the crucial moment. Uh, and if that's a success, then basically that's the cusp of, of this new era of commercial space flight. Of course, we know we have the example in the UK of Richard Branson's uh, Virgin Galactic. They've already entered space, uh, just as a, as sort of a hop, not, not in orbit. Um, but it's, it's really taking off now. There are multiple uh, private enterprises that are, that are going for it for space tourism. Uh, make it much cheaper and so it becomes actually feasible for instance to to fly to the moon establish a base there and even uh, potentially to mars uh, uh, in the next decades so when will there be a base on the moon <laughs> that i'm not gonna i'm not <laughs> gonna place a bet on that uh, it, it, it is technologically it's possible but uh, again it's still expensive so it, it has to have the political will behind it uh, to to invest uh, enough money in, in it um, but um, there are now multiple uh, agencies, uh, including the Chinese, that have uh, expressed a clear uh, interest, uh, maybe a bit more than just an interest in, in establishing a moon base yeah. sooner rather than later. Yeah, uh, the change today is that we're now looking at a commercial future in space. We'll be looking at space tourism. I'm just wondering what an astrophysicist, what would you pay to go into space yourself? Um, well, as an astrophysicist, um, space is still the best place to be based when studying the universe. Um, although um, having human presence might, might interfere with observations, uh, but having a base on the moon, for instance, uh, would be very exciting to, uh, to study the universe as an astrophysicist. Uh, but also I'm a scientist, and uh, scientists are curious, and they want to push uh, um, us to the limits of what's, what's possible, and uh, in this way, uh, of course, we drive also technological progress, and uh, this is what, what humans do, this, this is their nature, and this is how we, we live our lives now with all the electronics and um, you know, the, the ease of uh, boarding an airplane and traveling to the other side of the world. It wouldn't have happened if we didn't have the, this drive of always pushing, pushing us to the limits of what's, what's technologically possible. It's really good to talk to you about it. Uh, that's Dr. Jacob van uh, Loon. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Hello, welcome to BBC World News. Well, a moment of space history has been made. America's first commercial astronaut capsule has successfully completed its demonstration flight, splashing down in the Atlantic in the past few hours. Let's show you the moment the spacecraft built by the commercial company SpaceX landed on the ocean where a recovery vessel was waiting. Just listen to the jubilation there at Mission Control. And another piece of history, this is the first time in almost 50 years, almost to the day, a capsule designed for humans actually landed in the Atlantic. The last time anyone saw this live was Apollo 9 in 1969. Now, retro rockets had slowed the Dragon down to take it through the Earth's atmosphere after undocking from the International Space Station. Now, science correspondent Rebecca Morrell told me about the smooth landing. 
Oh, it did look quite good, didn't it, actually? I mean, those, when you think about the journey that this capsule has been on, you know, last Saturday it took off on the Falcon 9, it spent several days on the space station, and then the process of re-entry is really, really hard, actually. It has to endure temperatures of 1,500 degrees Celsius as it goes through the Earth's atmosphere. It's going incredibly fast, 30,000 kilometres an hour. And then, you know, the pictures we see of it sort of deploying those parachutes and just gently splashing down into the ocean you know it makes it all look very easy but it did look good and they've just recovered the capsule so so now will be the key time because they'll be wanting to test its performance and also to take a look inside because there was a, a test dummy in there. I was going to ask you who the passenger was. Yes, Ripley, its <laughs> name is Ripley, not a real person, just a test dummy. Um, but it's covered in sensors and the idea is to sort of see what kind of experience an astronaut would have were they to have been on this mission. So they'll be looking really carefully at that data to see, see how it fared. And if it is decided that it is all systems go, what is the next step? Well, in the next few weeks, it's going to do its second test, which is quite an interesting one. It's an emergency abort procedure. So basically, um, the rocket will go up, the capsule is on the rocket, and then a command will be sent through, and you'll see the capsule being jettisoned off with its rockets. And that's really important, because if there's a failure on the runway or just minutes into launch, it's important that any astronauts could get away safely. If that goes to plan, then in July or August, then we should see two astronauts um, heading up to the International Space Station on the Dragon capsule. And this is remarkable, not only because this is a collaboration with a commercial company, but also since 2011, America hasn't been able to put its own astronauts in space. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing, really, when you think of this great space-going nation. You know, since the retirement of the Space Shuttle, which was on safety grounds because of the two catastrophes they had, but also on price, they've had no way of getting their astronauts up to the space station, which they also have a tremendous stake in. They've had to actually buy seats on the Russian Soyuz system. So this really marks a change for them. But I think it is interesting, this tie-in with a commercial company, because until now, everything was built by NASA, designed by NASA, you know, controlled by NASA. And this is a very different prospect. Well, let's take you live to Princeton, New Jersey, where we can speak to Joe Dunkley, an astrophysicist at Princeton University. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, clearly, this flight has all gone to plan. What is the significance of that? Well, I think it's enormously exciting because it means that we can now, you know, we can send rockets and missions into space. You know, we can actually hope to send astronauts soon. And not only can we send them to the International Space Station, but we can actually hope to, to go further. You know, perhaps we really will get to the moon. Uh, this craft, of course, had a dummy on board. But how close do you think uh, this takes us to the next manned flight? Well, I think my understanding is very soon, right? So the, the big new thing about this mission was this flight was that it was in this new spacecraft that was actually prepared for people to go on and so the fact that it's been a success means that i think we're expecting in july this year to see real astronauts on board on board um the same dragon 2 spacecraft this of course uh was paid for and the brainchild of Elon Musk. It was a commercial enterprise. Does this mark a, a real shift in space travel and development? I think it does. I think it, it shows the, a great partnership possible between companies and between NASA and other space, in, space um, agencies. So, you know, we've seen this now from SpaceX, but we're actually expecting, I think, next month, a similar uh, flight from the Boeing Starliner. Um, similar kind of test flight and then a manned flight, hopefully later, or uh, crewed flight, let me say, later this year. Um, and, but it's in partnership with NASA, and I think this, this fact that we can bring in companies to work with the space agencies is extremely exciting. The space race in the past was always between the superpowers, between the United States and Russia, uh, the Soviet Union in the past, of course. There's now a competition of a different type. Uh, that's right. Well, I mean, the diff all the different nations will be trying, the different nations are trying to, you know, push forward their space exploration now. So we're seeing now there's competition, there's competition within the companies and there's still going to be competition between the nations too. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's efforts in China and Russia um, and still in Europe as well. So I think we'll, we'll I, it's healthy, I think it's exciting because it means, you know, competition is good. <laughs> it'll get us, it'll get us back out there. And how um, and how complex was this mission, essentially this 
went up to the International Space Agency, then came back down again. It's incredibly impressive. I mean, just watching, I was watching it, you know, earlier on in the NASA TV that, that um, to actually launch, you know, launch the rocket, send it out to the space station, dock, um, and, and with conditions such that real, a person could really travel safely on board, I think that's a huge advance. Um, and then to, you know, undock, come back down and land safely. Those are a lot of moving parts. So, you know, I have enormous respect for, for SpaceX for doing this. Okay, Joe Dundry, thank you very much indeed for joining us from Princeton. Thank you. Well, let's speak to the astronomer, Dr. Megan Argo. Thanks very much indeed for joining us this evening. Um, this flight seemed to go like clockwork. What do you think is the significance of this? It did. It seemed to be a textbook example of how to do a space flight. Um, I think it's really, really exciting. This is the first time that they've done an autonomous docking of a commercial vehicle with the International Space Station, and that is quite an achievement in itself. And that opens up so much more in terms of how to get things to the International Space Station without having to rely on other countries for, for their technology. Uh, yes, this uh, capsule contained a dummy, but how cl close do you think it takes us to a, a manned flight up to the International Space Station? Well, I gather that they're hoping to actually send the first manned mission with this capsule up, um, I think, in July this year in the summer. And assuming they've got a few more tests to run first, obviously, before it meets the specifications and they can verify that everything's working to, to specs. But if it passes all of those tests, then it looks likely that before the end of this year, we'll actually have a manned space flight on, on this, this capsule. Uh, because until now, the United States has been reliant on other countries to take its astronauts up. That's right. Since the shuttle retired in 2011, uh, they've had to rely on the Soyuz capsule, which is manufactured and launched by the Russians, um, which is a fantastic capsule. It's a workhorse. It's been around for, for decades and it's a re very reliable piece of machinery. Um, but not having their own capability, it means that they have to pay for the Russians, basically, to launch an astronaut every time they need to send somebody up to the International Space Station. And that, that limits what you can do. So hopefully when, when this passes all of the safety checks, um, I think the actual headline cost sort of per seat per astronaut, if you like, like for this capsule is about a quarter of what it costs to put an astronaut up on a Soyuz flight. So it's going to reduce NASA's costs in terms of actually sending people to the space station. And this was a commercial venture. What difference do, does it make that this is not a space race between nations, between superpowers as we saw in the past? That's right. In the past, every manned space flight basically has been done by a government organization funded by you know, a government body. Um, this one is, is new. It's done by a commercial body. They were paid by NASA partly to develop um, this spacecraft, but still they are a commercial company and that makes them a lot more agile. They're not reliant on the whims of politicians changing what they decide their funding priorities are. So it does make the future of manned spaceflight and commercial spaceflight much more viable. And we're now seeing other commercial companies uh, vying with one another to try to carry out the next stage of this. Yeah, that's right. There's a few people in the running. So we've also got um, Jeff Bezos' company Blue Origin working on a um, suborbital flights. We've got Virgin Galactic planning to do suborbital flights fairly soon as well. Um, and Boeing are also being contracted by NASA to develop a, a capsule as well. So there are several companies out there working on, on commercial capsules. Okay, Dr. Megan Argo, thanks very much indeed for talking to us.